But earlier this morning, Pfizer saying that its COVID-19 vaccine is 95% effective. Of course, uh, joining Moderna, um, their news from Monday that their vaccine candidate 94 and <laughs> percent effective. This news coming as COVID cases continue to surge across the U.S. hospitalizations at a record high. So let's begin with the state of the pandemic right now. For more on that conversation, we're joined by Dr. Celine Gounder. She's a clinical assistant professor of medicine and infectious diseases at the NYU School of Medicine in Bellevue Hospital. She's the host and producer of American Diagnosis and Epidemic Podcast. She is also a member of President-Elect Joe Biden's COVID advisory board. And Dr. Gounder, thank you so much for joining uh, the program this morning. Let's begin with that news that we got out of Pfizer. We now have two vaccine candidates uh, essentially in the same at the same level of efficacy, 94.5%, 95%. As you think about that news um, and what it means for the pandemic into 2021, how encouraged are you by this? Is this uh, perhaps surprising any expectations you had for vaccine development um, earlier this year? Well, I think to have a, two vaccines, not just one, that seem to be this effective is really quite promising. And I think uh, should be seen as light at the end of the tunnel. The fact is, though, that tunnel, uh, we still have a ways to go. Uh, we still need to double down on things like mask wearing, social distancing, trying to spend as much time outdoors if we're around other people, getting tested and working with contact tracers if they reach out to you to help identify sources of transmission. So all of those things we really do need to keep doing. The vaccines will not be available to the general public until April or May. But you know the way I think about that is if you do each of those things, the mask wearing and so on, you are very concretely saving lives during that time because once the vaccine gets out there, those are all lives your actions will have taken, those actions you've taken will have saved uh, in the interim. So I, I think it's really important to understand that we still have a little ways to go. Dr. Gounder, Anjali here. Looking at what Operation Warp Speed has accomplished just in terms of elevating the development of the vaccines, uh, is there any thought as to you know, continuing it or what elements you might change of it or advise to change of it as it stands right now? It's really impossible to answer that question until the GSA goes through ascertainment, um, certifies that we can move forward uh, with the transition, um, because we're not being allowed to have those conversations with career officials who, who have access to data that we simply do not have access to right now. Uh, we simply do not have details of what some of those uh, negotiations and, and relationships with uh, pharmaceutical companies have been. So we can't really assess how things are, are working well or not and what we would change until there is more of a transition. Uh, Dr. Gander, let's let's talk more about that uh, lack of communication over the transition. Um, what exactly are the attempts that the team has made and what have you heard back from the administration or is it just sort of a asylum treatment? I mean, give us some insight into what exactly is going on. Well, we as a team are moving forward with our own plans while we, as you call it, get the silent treatment from, from the administration. Um, so we are a very seasoned team in terms of government experience. Uh, the president-elect has had over four decades of experience uh, in, in federal um, government um, and, and policymaking. And you have people like Ron Klain, who's worked in multiple different uh, White Houses, who has the experience of being the Ebola um, White House coordinator under President Obama. Um, so these are people who understand how uh, institutions function, how agencies interface with one another. So that that is a big part of, of the job, is just understanding the mechanics of how government works. Um, and then in addition to that, we are moving forward with our own plans based on publicly available data. Um, and, and we're moving forward with, with conversations with other stakeholders. So that may include um, transition team members speaking with governors, other state and local officials, including public health officials, and uh, conversations with the private sector. And in the interim, of course, before um, President-elect Joe Biden takes office on January 20th, presumably we will have a similar trajectory in terms of public policy. It doesn't seem like anything's changing on that front. And as every health expert who has come on the program has reminded folks, we need to wear masks, we need to wash our hands, we need to have social distancing. And yet, as I've been asking most folks, it doesn't appear that people are doing that. 
And so, or at least not doing it in high enough numbers to prevent the upward trajectory that we have seen. So given the facts on the ground right now, what does one do <laughs> from a public health perspective to deal with the crisis at hand, given that people don't seem to be following directives? Well, I do think it's important, actually, if you look at the data, survey data on what Americans are doing, they are actually getting better at mask wearing. They're not perfect about it. They're not doing it all the time. You still have a vocal minority that's very opposed to wearing masks. But over 90 percent of Americans are wearing masks at least some of the time now. So that is definitely progress. Uh, and I think we really have to keep doubling down on our messaging about that. Uh, about the mask wearing, the social distancing. We really need to be communicating about the risk of the holidays being super spreader events and trying to figure out how we can celebrate these things safely. Uh, you know, maybe Thanksgiving this year is not sitting around a table indoors. Maybe it's an outdoor hike and picnic. Um, you know, so really trying to be creative about how we can do these things safely. Doctor, there's, there's been a lot of concern in our, our world of, of business and finance on the economic fallout if there is a national lockdown. Do you support a national lockdown? And if not, what would you recommend to President-elect Joe Biden doing his first 100 days to, to get this situation under control as we start distributing these vaccines? A national lockdown or shutdown is simply not on the table. The president-elect has no intention of implementing a national lockdown. Uh, there may be some differences of opinion um, on the advisory board, but the consensus on the advisory board is also that we do not need a uh, national lockdown is not indicated here. We have learned a lot since the spring. Um, I think lockdowns are sort of uh, coronavirus control 1.0. It's a bit like an on and off light switch. And we are now in coronavirus control 2.0. Think of it like a dimmer switch where we can be a lot more targeted in what we do. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of that. In uh, New York City, when we had a surge in cases a couple months ago now, um, we were able to target based on zip code and we massively ramped up testing and contact tracing in those areas. And that was successful in quelling transmission in those areas. Our, earlier this week, Governor Whitmer announced new restrictions in Michigan, but that is not a lockdown. She's saying for older students, for example, in high school and college, they need to go back to virtual learning, uh, younger students in elementary schools, so long as uh, the schools can implement other safety measures like the mask wearing, the reducing class size, the ventilation, uh, elementary school students can stay in school. Gyms, you know, group classes, not a good idea, but individual workouts at the gym, if people can stand um, apart, be, be uh, socially distanced within the gym, wearing masks, having good ventilation in the gym, that can continue. So we're really, um, based on what we've learned about the transmission, uh, targeting our, our interventions much more specifically. Dr. Gounder, I wonder from your perspective, as someone who's part of the medical community, we've seen a lot of uh, mistrust build up uh, with federal agencies like the FDA, and they're, they're trying hard now to sort of uh, uh, assuage a little bit of that uh, when it comes to the emergency use authorization of the vaccines. Any thoughts right now about the previous rushes to approve things such as remdesivir and what we can expect going forward if, if there's anything to address there? Well, I think with the vaccines, what you're seeing is a return to business as usual in terms of the FDA approval process. Uh, many of us uh, in, in the medical and scientific com community, including myself, have been outspoken about this, uh, putting pressure on not just the FDA, but also pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer to uh, abide by what are norms in terms of the scientific approvals of the vaccine. And, and I think that is what you're seeing. Um, and, and I am confident that once these do get an emergency use authorization, that that will be truly an indication of safety and efficacy. We will continue to collect data on these vaccines even afterwards, uh, because that's still not a full approval. Uh, and it was these vaccines will still need to go through the full approval process. And so we'll still be monitoring to make sure that there are not any uh, issues that have not been detected thus far. All right, Dr. Celine Gounder, member uh, on President-elect Joe Biden's COVID task force. Dr. Gounder, thank you so much for joining uh, the program today. Hopefully we can be in touch soon. Absolutely. My pleasure.